We're speaking this evening about the record of the rocks. As someone told me, for a fellow who has rocks in his head, this is a very appropriate subject. Uh, I plead guilty to that. I enjoy talking about the rocks. They do provide a challenge, at least in terms of the way they're typically presented. If you watch the education channels, public TV, uh, you look in the earth science textbooks, you'll see evidence from the rocks representing that which flatly contradicts what we read in the Bible. When we look at the rocks, we're talking about not just all rocks, but the record that we have reference to involves the sedimentary rocks. That's rocks laid down by water. And if you have studied earth science, know just a little bit about geology, you understand that there is an average of about a mile and a half of sedimentary rock that covers the continents. That's rocks laid down by water. Now in those rocks, there are billions and billions of dead things that are fossils. Now when you have billions and billions of dead things and rocks laid down by water all over the world, uh, I think you've got a pretty strong argument for catastrophic judgment. But of course the evolutionist tells us this was accomplished by a slow gradual buildup over millions of years. And as we saw last night, I think it's accomplished by a rapid year-long series of catastrophes that it could not be slow and the evidence for slow um, is not there. But the evolutionary representation of this record of the rocks looks like this. This is in all the biology textbooks, all the earth science textbooks. And we're told that as you go further down in the rocks, you find these simple animals. And as you come up nor near the top, they get more complex. And then the modern animals near the top, which shows an evolutionary progression. And the record of the rocks has recorded like a tape recorder, the evolution of life through time. That's their interpretation of what we're seeing. The biggest problem with this representation is rather obvious, and that is that you can't go out and look in the rocks and find it anywhere. It exists in the textbooks, but it does not exist anywhere on the face of the earth that is in the complete form that you see in the textbooks. Now if that sounds like a rather brash statement, notice the, uh, the quote from Leet and Judson, one of the typical textbooks used as a geology text in our universities. Because we cannot find sedimentary rock representing all of earth time neatly in one convenient area, we must piece together the rock sequence from locality to locality. This process of tying one rock sequence in one place to another in some other place is known as correlation. And so instead of digging down and finding it in any one place, you find some over here and find some over there and you tie it together and correlate it, correlate the layers, not based on what you see in any one place. As the Encyclopedia Britannica says, the end product of correlation is a mental abstraction called the geologic column. Now, you don't get that impression in the undergraduate earth science textbooks. That's a shame. But this is not concrete, if you please. Uh, it is a mental abstraction that is built together. Well, how do you build it? How do you know when you correlate whether this rock goes down or up? Well, if you're an evolutionist and you have rocks with simple animals, where do they go? They go on the bottom. I'm somewhat oversimplifying, but that's a general picture of what's happening. R.H. Rastel in the Encyclopedia Britannica puts it this way. It cannot be denied that geologists are here arguing in a circle. The succession of organisms has been determined by a study of their remains embedded in the rocks and the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the organisms they contain. Now, let me illustrate and simplify, somewhat oversimplifying, but still 
uh, not misrepresenting. A person says, we have a primitive fossil here. Okay, how do you know? And then, of course, that would go on the bottom of the column. But how do you know that's a primitive fossil? Well, it's found in an old rock. All right, that would make sense. Uh, if you've got an old rock, it'd be a primitive fossil. But now, how do you know that this is an old rock? Well, it's got a primitive fossil in it. You see. And this is obviously not proving anything. But that is how this column in its complete form is built. You don't determine the kind of rock it is by the kind of rock it is, but by the critters that you find in it, the dead things in the rock and uh, how primitive you think they are. There are a number of other problems with it as well. For one thing, as we look at this column, we see mostly animals with backbones or the vertebrates. Relatively speaking, they just uh, virtually don't exist in the fossil record. It's mainly clams, clams and more clams, uh, at least proportionately. It's skewed, obviously, to the more impressive, larger animals, whereas at least 95% of the entire fossil record is composed of marine invertebrates. But you virtually see none of those in the geologic column. Of the 5% that's left, 4.5% are plants and algae. And we hadn't gotten to the vertebrates yet, which are mostly what you see represented in the column. The vertebrates are about one one hundredth of one percent. Not one percent. <laughs> one one hundredth of a percent. That's just virtually not there. Most of it's, well, why don't you then represent it with marine invertebrates? Somebody might get the impression this is a marine deposit or maybe a flood deposit which was the impression of the founders of the discipline of geology. They all thought that because I think that's what it clearly indicates for reasons we'll be looking at. The father of modern stratigraphy, Nicholas Stino, is touted as a hero today in all the geology textbooks. Dot and Batten's evolution of the earth says besides correctly interpreting fossils, the result was the formulation of the most basic principles for analysis of earth history. Stino showed great insight and he He's the one that started it, and his rules are the ones you have to memorize in order to pass stratigraphy today. Steno's axioms provide the ultimate basis of practically all interpretation of Earth history, so their importance can hardly be overemphasized. I had one geology professor interrupt a presentation I was making down at Lamar University. We know all about Nicholas Steno. We have to memorize his 12 axioms, and she had to rattle them off right in the middle of the presentation. Well, I'm glad that you know about him and understand Nicholas Stino. But do you know how he thought this record came to be? Well, yes, he was an evolutionist. Well, <laughs> that's just not the case. Uh, his book was on display in Cambridge where I was doing work there at Trinity College. And this is a picture of that book, and it's in the fly piece stating it's dedicated to the proof of the Noachian deluge. This is where he was coming from. In fact, it was revealed, uh, and it's just pretty much a revelation, uh, last year in geology that Steno believed in a universal flood throughout his life. This is how he explained it, and he understood it well enough to write the rules that you still have to memorize if you're going to pass stratigraphy. Now, people will say, well, this flood geology is a bunch of foolishness. It won't really explain what we see in geology. Is that so? Nicholas Stino refutes that. This was his concept, and he was a pioneer who was a, a genius. And uh, if you don't understand what he understands, uh, you can't do geology today. Building on his work, men like Whitcomb and Morris wrote the Genesis flood compiling the evidence from geology together with what we know in Genesis and showing that this is the best explanation for what we see in the rock record. Interestingly, John C. McCampbell agreed to write the foreword to this book. He's an evolutionist, 
professor and head of the Department of Geology at the University of Southeastern Louisiana. And he says in that foreword that the facts of geology do fit this explanation and that the authors make a very strong case for this explanation and present a serious challenge to the evolutionary interpretation. Now, he didn't say their view fits, our view doesn't, but he came pretty close, even though he's an evolutionist. It does fit. And so when people say, well, it's, it's just no way that a flood can explain what we see in geology, well, that, they just don't know what they're talking about. But if you had a flood, wouldn't it just mix everything up? Not necessarily. You have floods that bury things basically where they are, transporting sometimes, but the general rule is things get buried where they live and not everything lives at the same place. Things that live at the bottom of the ocean would be buried in different places from things that live up here in Texas. And you see gradations even in the ocean. The Cambrian, the bottom lowest layer as defined by the evolutionist, is ocean bottom. Critters that lived on the bottom of the ocean, some of them very complex as we'll see. And the Ordovician lived a little higher. The Devonian still higher with some amphibians. And the worldwide flood would bury organisms where they lived, and I think we see that at least in a general way. And I underscore that because there's going to be some mixing. But in a general way, that would be reflected. And as we see and imagine the water rising, we would see different environments being buried. Now, they're not all together in one place. And you may have two or three of these in one place, but seldom more than that. But here, putting them together, it would leave a picture like this. And then when buried, uh, we can see that it would leave a deposit that would have some kind of an order. Here we see the kind of deposit that would segregate and separate the groups of animals. And they would be buried separately, not because... They're separated by millions of years, but because they live in different places, and that's where they'd be buried. Now, you don't have this kind of an ordered sequence. This is an arranged, skewed misrepresentation of what's actually there. It's a conceptual correlation that is useless as proof of evolution because it's based on the circular logic. But you do see a general order, I think, that reflects the ecology that we can observe today. I do think this representation, however, is useful as a model, as a representation of what ought to be if evolution is true. Now, we don't assume the thing to be true, build an illustration of it and say, see, it's proved. That's the circular logic. It's not proof. But it's a good model. It's an illustration of what ought to be, if evolution is true, we have an alternative model, and then we compare that with the real world, with the facts, and that's how we test. We don't just holler and see who can say it's proved loudest. We look at the evidence, and we see which fits the facts best. How do you test this model against the facts? I think Stephen Stanley does a good job of describing how that test should proceed from Johns Hopkins University. He's a very famous geologist, and he says topsy-turvy fossils would test it. We'll look at a fuller description of that before we conclude tonight, but this idea of things that are supposed to be at the bottom on top or things supposed to be on the top on bottom, topsy-turvy fossils, would disprove evolution. Any topsy-turvy sequence of fossils would force us to rethink our theory. And so if you're finding things that are supposed to be on the bottom up at the top, then you've got a problem. Well, you should have. The problem for the evolutionist is we find that kind of thing all the time. That's really not that unusual. They're called living fossils. Niles Eldridge wrote a book about that. He's the curator of the uh, American Museum of Natural History and Professor at Columbia. He says there seems to have been almost no change in any part we can compare that is, of these ancient fossils supposed to be down at the bottom that are found alive today, we've not completely solved the riddle of living fossils. That would be a topsy-turvy fossil, but there are so many and it's so common, they really just don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. They really won't 
the other kind of contradiction, as we'll see. But to give an illustration of what he's talking about with living fossils, maybe the most famous one is the coelacanth. A uh, beautiful fossil here of a rather strange-looking fish, but one that we find rather commonly in the fossil record. Described here by Keith Thompson, who's president of the Academy of Natural Sciences, as a living fossil. Uh, he says in his book, a fish thought to be extinct for 70 million years, which is about the time the dinosaurs have been extinct. The fish was a coelacan, an animal that thrived concurrently with the dinosaurs. But from the point where they're supposed to have gone extinct, all the way up the column, you find no coelacans and virtually no dinosaurs. They look quite like the what? <laughs> the modern forms, yes, we have found them. Now, he says we have no fossil coelacans younger than the late Cretaceous. That's where the dinosaurs are supposed to have gone extinct. And so... We've got plenty of them up to that point. From that point forward, nothing. But so far, we've caught about 600 of them out in the ocean since 1937 when we found the first one. But they were extinct at the same time, well, because we don't have them in the column. If they stop in the column and you don't have them above, I think that just means they didn't live at these places. They lived at these places. And the fact you don't find them up here doesn't mean that they're not still around somewhere. Uh, that's the Topsy fossils, the thing supposed to be at the bottom that you find at the top. Alan Turner refers to that and especially the implications regarding extinction. Uh, just, uh, what, in September of this year, paleontologists really don't know the answer to that. You think some of, you, some of these quotations are maybe from five or six years ago, and you're like, well, surely they've learned something since then. Well, this is pretty much up to date, I think, September 6, 2007. We don't know the answer to that. Why some animals survive extinction, others don't, is one of the most difficult questions in paleontology, and why you see this thing that's obviously extinct, according to the column, but swimming around, they don't know. It does falsify the idea that because you don't find it above a certain point, it's extinct. And you have literally hundreds of examples of that. But the thing that really is a test in the mind of the evolutionist is the other kind of contradiction. What's supposed to be up, found down, or what we'll call the turvy fossils. Because if... <laughs> The, the mammals had not got there yet, and you find them down here at the bottom, then obviously you've got a real, real challenge. Richard Dawkins describes the implications. Uh, we've spoken about him several times this week. We should be very surprised, for example, to find humans appearing in the record before mammals are supposed to have evolved. If a single well-verified mammal skull were to turn up in 500 million-year-old rocks, our whole modern theory of evolution would be utterly destroyed. So he's got his chin out pretty far here. You, don't, you can't find this. And he's rather confident because if you do find it, then he's got answers for that too. For example, we have found that kind of thing rather commonly. One very obvious and dramatic example is near LaSalle, Utah, where perfectly modern human skeletons replaced with malachite are found in a layer that's also found at Dinosaur National Monument, one that is known for its dinosaurs in the Dakota Sandstone. So the key phrase in his statement is, if a well-verified mammal skull were to show up, and when you find it, it's not going to be verified. It must have fallen down a crack. They crawled back in a cave. This is a, a mine collapse or any kind of explanation had no have to have evidence for it. You know dinosaurs didn't live with humans. They were 100 million years apart, most of them. And so if you find them together, something bad happened. Something, something got messed up. Well, we went back to the site to see if we could well verify. And it's a part of an open pit copper mine, just about 20 miles south of Moab. And where you see the backhoe here is where the skeletons were found. Here is one of them still in the rock. This is 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone. And you see in the lower right-hand corner the pelvis, the knee up near the top, 
the foot over in the lower left. This one is articulated or together as in life. Uh, most of them are just bones piled together as is the case here. Some of these look like they go together. They really don't. They're just piled together. This is one that had been out of the rock for about five minutes when we washed it off there with a canteen and held it up for the picture. It's replaced with malachite, which obviously shows it's not a recent burial. It contains no collagen. That typically takes about a thousand years uh, to dissipate. And so this is an excellent turvy fossil. I think there's as much verification as you could ever find. We talked to the fellow who uh, actually uncovered it with the bulldozer. And ironically, his father drove the bulldozer at this spot numbers of years ago. This is Dave Fuller. Uh, and he's pointing to the spot where this was found, says there were no broken layers, there were no caves, uh, no mine. Looking at a side view, we see the mining operation of the 30s where his father drove the bulldozer and they hit rocks so hard that they were tearing up the bulldozers. And so it stopped and went out of business and didn't start again until the 70s. And then they went on down to this level where the skeletons were found. Again, a diagram here shows the mining operation of the 30s and then the 70s. Here, the road cut was done in 1930, and prior to the road cut, this was completely continuous. The skeletons were found here, again, 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone. There is zero evidence uh, for the intrusional burial of these skeletons. In fact, just overwhelming evidence against it. If they're before 1930, this is the way it looked. And remember then what Dawkins says, if you can well verify it, his conclusion is evolution would be utterly destroyed. I think that's exactly what's happened. But anytime you find bones, they're going to be intrusionally buried. That's just the assumption. But he goes on in this discussion of what would test and uh, falsify evolution, saying... Ironically, it's also the reason why creationists are so keen on the fake human footprints which were carved during the Depression to fool tourists in the dinosaur beds of Texas. So he's heard about our work down at Glen Rose all the way from Oxford. He refuses to come look, but he's sure that they're fake, but understands that if they were real, this would falsify and utterly destroy and of course, one of the main reasons that, uh, for the interest is that you can't intrusionally bury footprints, can you? They are where they are. You can't erode them and redeposit and they don't fall down cracks. And so this is really better evidence than the bones, which he understands. Several of you here have traveled with us down to Dinosaur Valley State Park and seen the footprints there. This is where the Paluxy River runs through the park and they're just uh, all kinds of dinosaur tracks all over the place down there. They were made famous back in the 40s by Roland T. Byrd, who published a number of articles, and we can see the big sauropod-like elephant tracks almost, and then the three-toed theropods. Uh, here's one of those three-toed tracks, which is rather unusual. It's raised, which caused us to do some head scratching here. How is it really? Tracks should be depressed, shouldn't they? Well, yes, but... What happened here, the dinosaur stepped, sunk down, left the depressed track. Other material washed over, filled it in, and what filled it in became harder when it became rock so that when it's later uncovered and erosion now affects it, the center, the infill, is resistant, more resistant to erosion than what's around it, and so it winds up being raised. This is the raised infill. That's significant for some points we'll make again in a moment. But in addition to tracks like this, we also have tracks that look like this. Wonder what that could be. Well, it couldn't be a human track. They'd, they were 100 million years apart from the dinosaurs, according to the evolutionists. If they're together, it would utterly destroy. And so it, well, this one has to be carved. And this is Dawkins' conclusion. We'll come back to that in a moment. I, I was somewhat intimidated by the objection because it, it was just almost too good to be true. And so we looked around for some that weren't quite so good and found some as well. Here's one in the lower right-hand corner that was identified by the Dallas Crime Lab as a human footprint. By the same criteria, they identify footprints at a crime scene, along with 
dinosaur tracks that had just been excavated. And some of the tracks that we found were very, very human-like. But the explanation was either that this is erosion or uh, they were carved. It has to be one or the other. So we got a new set of objections <laughs> instead of falling down a crack or intrusionally buried. Now then, it's, it's erosion or carved. Well, Stan Taylor decided to test some of these ideas back in the early 70s, taking a bulldozer uh, backhoe and following a trail of two tracks that were seen there in the river that came out of the riverbank. Well, they're alternating layers of clay and limestone and clay and limestone, about six feet of them there. And if he removes that and these tracks continue back up under the bank, what would that say about the idea they'd been carved? That'd pretty well rip it, wouldn't it? He did, and yes, found nine more tracks, for a total of 11, in a right-left pattern, some of them very clear and obvious with the mud push-up around it that you can see here, uh, again, arguing against the erosion factor. That doesn't leave uh, a ring around the shape. And so a lot of people got excited about this. It looked like very good evidence. And then Glenn Kuban came up with an explanation, and he got humanist of the year for this explanation. He says, are these kind of duck-looking tracks, and there are several of those in the area, a road to look like the one on the right, but the elongate tracks, like you see here at B, erode over a period of time to finally wind up looking like the one down at the lower right-hand corner, and that's kind of human-like, and so these are just eroded dinosaur tracks. And now then, we don't have to worry about that anymore. However, when you go back and look at these tracks, here are some of the dinosaur tracks with that uh, infill that was harder. And what happens with erosion here? It gets sharper and clearer because the infill is harder. And when you look at a side view, the three-dimensional aspect of this shows the center being raised, and that's not going to erode to look like a human track, is it? It looks more like a dinosaur track with more erosion. And some of the casts that were made by Stan Taylor were so detailed. Does this look like uh, an eroded dinosaur track? Are they just, uh, just too much detail for that to be a credible thought? You put a human foot in it and it fits perfectly. The one that really persuaded me, and I was trying to play the devil's advocate, is there some way that this could be explained? was this track, and you have to, and this, we extended that 11 series, 11 track series to 14. This was one in the extension. You have to look at this a minute to really see it. As we highlight this area, you can see the dinosaur portion of it. It's about 25 inches long, but look what is in the middle of it. With all five toes and instep and heel but this one is perfect. Several were saying, well, maybe it's erosion. Others were saying, maybe it's carved. And when you get both, you know it's right in the middle <laughs> and is exactly as good as it can get. We made a presentation of this at a national science meeting up in Tennessee. Glenn Kuban was there, who won Humanist of the Year for explaining these away. He was on the plane the next morning and in the river that afternoon with a long iron pole. And... Uh, we got several calls saying he's out there with an iron pole and got out there, and by the time we got there, it looked like this. It had just been beaten to pieces. Uh, of course, we had uh, excellent casts and stereo photographs and uh, hundreds of uh, photographic documentations, but he was evidently pretty impressed with the footprint. As you go further up the trail, this is several tracks ahead, you see another. Now, there are 134 dinosaur tracks on this platform and 14 human tracks going through the middle. And sometimes they're beside and across and just outside, sometimes within. Here again, within. Notice the three-toed dinosaur track up in the anterior forward portion of the track, but in the back portion, it looks like that depressed area is uh, where somebody stepped on it. Again, from a side view of that same track, you see the three toes to the right, almost flush, and perhaps will be raised with further erosion, but the depressed portion fits the human foot just perfectly. When you put your foot in it, it's, it's like a glove. Now, this one is a right. What should we have ahead of it? We should have a left. Here's the next one. And it's right, left for 
14. Looking at a side view of this track, you can see that the dinosaur track is beside it. And uh, of course, the sandbags in the back, it's in the bottom of the river. It's a lot of work to get to do that. It's consistently 11 and a half inches. And this is an overview of the entire 14 track trail. Now, when you get 14 in a right left pattern, consistent in length, you're not looking at erosion. And of course, it was excavated, most of it, from under the overburden, which eliminates the carving. Now, you can see some strange things in the rocks that look like, wow, that maybe it looks like an Indian head when you go to the cave, you know, and look at the cave. You look up in the clouds and you see, wow, that looks like a bird, you know, and maybe some of these tracks just happen to look like a human foot. Uh, this was a sign I saw up in Oklahoma not long ago. You look at that and you say, well, maybe that's a funny looking cloud, but when you see the rest of it, you, <laughs> you think somebody's messing with the clouds here uh, because you've got more than one and that's not going to happen. You look at the old man in the mountain. Uh, that's maybe erosion, right? But how do you know that this is not erosion? Well, if you see four old men in the mountain, You've got, got a pretty good idea, don't you? Well, here you've got 14 in a right-left pattern that says, hey, this, I'm sorry, this, this is not erosion, and it's not carved. This becomes the perfect turvy fossil. We did the measurements and the analysis. All of them look at least like a general human footprint, consistent in length, more so than the dinosaur tracks, some of which are still being revealed. Seven of them have toes. Of course, we've shown you the most dramatic ones. That's very unusual with fossil footprints. Mary Leakey's tracks over in Africa, uh, several spreads in National Geographic, none of them have toe. Well, you can see the great toe in some, but none individual toes. Uh, you can distinguish right from left in 12 of the 14. Two of them are just kind of oblong, and when Glenn Kuban lectures on this subject, guess which two he shows you? We did a double blind test at Kansas State University with the psych department showing pictures. First, what are these? And uh, 80, well, 97% said they're human footprints. Uh, then we got real rough on the college students. Tell us if they're rights or lefts. <laughs> and 87% uh, got exactly what we predicted. Uh, 12 out of 14, that's just about precisely what we expected, and none of them were consistently different so that you can say it is consistently rights and lefts where they ought to be. Now, this is the way you do science. Dawkins sits behind his desk at Oxford and says, no way, it's impossible. And we get out and do the work, and I think you can see the difference. This, I think, is the perfect turvy fossil. You can't fall down a crack, intrusionally bury them. They can't be carved. They were excavated from under the overburden. It's not erosion. You got 14 in a right-left pattern. And I just really enjoy presenting this on the college campus and then sitting back and saying, okay, now, what's your explanation? I was at a university up in Tennessee uh, several years ago speaking to a group of about 50 senior geology students, and uh, they turned around after I finished to the head of the department, okay, what, what do you have to say? And he said, of course, we don't know that there weren't dinosaurs back there with human feet. <laughs> and I thought a minute, I said, well, I, I guess that's right. Uh, it could have been. I also don't know that there weren't human back th humans back there with dinosaur feet. Wouldn't that make about as much sense? Now, I, I said, <laughs> wouldn't it be more reasonable to think these things look like dinosaur feet were made by dinosaurs and these things look like human feet were made by humans? No, he wouldn't agree. And I said, well, if they were made by humans, would they look any different? And he just got up and left. And uh, about half of that, well, a significant portion of that group became creationist. Um, but dinosaurs with human feet uh, is, is their explanation. Uh, Dr. Chuck Finsley, who was curator of the Dallas Museum of Natural History for some 30 years, recently retired, 
came down to Glen Rose and looked at it. He wanted to display some of the dinosaurs we had excavated. And we made him look at the tracks. And he got a little upset, left, and came back about a month later and got upset and left. <laughs> Third time down, he said, Dr. Patton, I, I think I've got an explanation for you. I can tell you what made these human-looking footprints. He says, I think they were made by aliens. Very serious. And I kind of snickered, and he got aggravated. And I said, well, Chuck, if they're made by aliens, I guess they came from a galaxy far, far away. They'd be more advanced than we are. What are they doing running around barefooted? <laughs> he left. <laughs> but this, this is the best they can do. I think you just ought to take the evidence for what it is instead of desperately trying to explain it away. It kind of reminds me of the Far Side cartoon by Gary Larson. Here's Professor Farrington and his controversial theory that dinosaurs were actually the discarded chicken bones of giant alien picnickers. <laughs> that sounds pretty far out to me. <laughs> if you want to draw a cartoon, uh, I think the reality would be more like this in the throes of a catastrophic flood. As they were trying to escape, they were running, and uh, these were the ones that missed the boat. When we exposed this material, and I think solved the, the riddle of several of the questions that had been asked, found extra tracks, documented the right-left pattern, the length and consistency of the trail. Uh, many were pressed with coming up with an answer. What do you say? Well, the typical thing they say is, I mean, just predict it. <laughs> well, you need more evidence. I mean, that, you can always say that. You, you need more evidence, and they do. And so in 2000, with the drought in this area, we noticed that this trail that's coming across what's called the Patton, well, the trail that's going across it here, we could see more of it because the water had gone down. And so we decided to pump the river dry. And so we got quite a few pumps and uh, 30, 40 people down there pretty regularly for over a three month period. And uh, with a lot of work, uh, a lot of shovels, a lot of movement of dirt and watering a lot of farmers' fields on either side of the river, uh, we pumped it dry and followed that trail and exposed the longest consecutive dinosaur trail on the American continent. Uh, 154 dinosaur tracks, over 500 feet long, and they're not only the, the longest trail, but they may be the clearest and most spectacular trail. The sharp detail is just, just awesome. Now, it really infuriated the fellow at the state park who had gotten his PhD studying these tracks that a creationist <laughs> made such a find right under his nose. But we know what dinosaur tracks look like and excavated the longest trail on the American continent, only one other in the world longer in Turkmenistan. And there's nothing here that looks like dinosaur tracks at all, but when you go up ahead, it crosses this trail of human tracks that are very consistent in length, right, left pattern, all five toes, instep, and heel. Then we presented that, and guess what they said then? Well, you need more evidence. You know? <laughs> and, okay, let's try the platform up ahead this time. And we moved ahead, and uh, this platform, we had to go down three or four layers till we got to the print layer, and sure enough, there's about 100 dinosaur tracks on this platform with uh, 15 human tracks going right through the middle of it. Different individual. This one was consistently, consistently about 10 inches, but the right-left pattern is obvious. And we look at a close-up here of the center, and we see two tracks that are slightly raised, uh, like the duck foot, uh, dinosaur footprints. Uh, but you can see that they match on either side. But the one on the right looks like something stepped in the back of it, doesn't it? And it's depressed. It's not raised. It came along after the infill had filled in the other tracks. Looking at a close-up 
of the one on the right, we'll see there is that duck-shaped dinosaur track that matches the one next to it perfectly, but again, the depressed track within it is just perfect. And if we had enough dark, you could actually count the knuckles and the toes here. And that's in a sequence of 15 in a right-left pattern. Okay, you want some more evidence? <laughs> it just keeps piling up, and they keep evading. Uh, I think we have just very exciting evidence to confront the evolutionary theories here. We went back to the burdick track. This one was one that had to be carved. It was too good to be true because, uh, well, it just uh, it, it, it looked awfully good. So I said, well, is there some way we can tell if this is carved or not? Well, when you section across it, sometimes, as indicated in the question a moment ago, you can see disturbed material underneath the surface. And so we sectioned, as you can see, several places. Here is a section at the heel. And in the center, you can see the displaced, disturbed material. Is this a carved track? Now, this is original impression. Carving would cut across rather than corresponding with uh, the disturbed material. We presented this at a science meeting in Dallas, and it got rather quiet. And then finally, one person said, well, this is obviously a real track, but it must be a dinosaur track that somebody carved toes on. <clears throat> and I'm glad he did that, because then we proceeded to section across the toes, as you can see here. And this is a real reach, because sometimes you section a dinosaur track and you see nothing. Um, but we were lucky with the fine-grained limestone preserved a lot of detail. Here is a section across the toes, and especially there at the great toe, you can see the following contours rather than cutting across them. Looking at a close-up here, uh, and actually there are structures under each of the toes, but uh, very dramatic at the great toe. And so we verify even at the toes that this is not a carved track. Then we get a new set of objections. They say, well, but it's too broad at the front. It's too narrow at the heel. And look at the center. It's raised. Tracks are not supposed to be raised in the middle. Um, and, of course, they had no idea what tracks are supposed to look like, and we didn't either. And so we went out and did some science. We got some uh, junior high kids to make some tracks in the concrete. And we found out that standing tracks and Walking tracks and running tracks are pretty easy to distinguish. They all look different. And what we're looking at here is a running track. Here is a little 12-year-old girl that made these tracks, uh, running both toward and uh, uh, away from us, looking at two here going in opposite directions. Uh, we can see the broad front here and the toes that are spread out, the narrow heel, and look at the raised center. When you're running, you push off with your toes, and so you have a broader front, and you rock over the center and leave the... We didn't know that, but what we learned indicated that if it were different, it would be wrong. The Burdick track is a very good running track. Uh, difficult even to make one that good today, but the same general configuration. Also in the area, we had a large cat track. There were seven of these. Uh, Dawkins said a large mammal skull, I think a large mammal foot would <laughs> fit the bill as well. This one is large. We talked about large animals the other evening. This one's nine inches across, big cat. Uh, and that would utterly destroy, according to Dawkins' criteria. We sectioned here across this, which they'd have to say was carved. And again, you see the following contours across the pad of the cat track showing that this is not carved either. This is a turvy fossil. All of this, of course, around Glen Rose. Let's go down to Sonora, Texas. Here is a sequence of three tracks. One of them, uh, you can see very clearly, is not just erosion in a rock, but very much like a human track. There are nine of them in a right-left pattern that can be followed there at Sonora. Up in the Panhandle at Stinnett, Texas, there's been on display for about 30 years a rock slab there in the center of the, of the courthouse that uh, obviously looks like a human foot in the Permian rock. This is supposedly 100 million years older than the ones at Glen Rose. 
Well, this has to be carved. It's just too clear, the little small foot and then the big one. But look at the thin layer that's revealed here by the broken section and compare it with the depth of the track looking sideways and you can see that the depth is considerably deeper than that little thin layer and if it were carved what would happen to that little thin layer? It would penetrate, wouldn't it? And it didn't. So we can see good indication this is not a carved track. We have found out where this uh, came from, the area. We've done a lot of research. We're doing an excavation beginning in two weeks uh, there at Stinnett and hope to find some more in place. Uh, but we don't find them just at Glen Rose by any means. This one is in New Mexico, again in the Permian, even worse for the evolutionists than the situation at Glen Rose. The photograph is a little bit deceitful in that uh, you wouldn't see that picture if you walked up on it. Uh, it's an extremely shallow track, and you have to have it wet and the sun angle just right in order to get the pretty picture like this. But when you do, you can see this very obviously is a clear track, but it's one that is like the kind of footprint you'd leave when you're walking with a wet foot on a tile floor. You're not sinking down that much. You get the hourglass shape with the little dots at the end, but we recognize that shape, don't we? and that's obviously a turvy fossil. Uh, in Turkmenistan that we mentioned earlier, there are a lot of dinosaur tracks. This is from Pravda. Uh, under the headline, Human Footprints Found on Dinosaurs Plateau, Turkmenian Plateau contains more than 3,000 footprints, but among the most mysterious fact is that among the footprints of dinosaurs, footprints of bare human feet are found. We've contacted a number, a number of, of Russian scientists. Uh, they don't like to talk about it, some, not all of them. Some of them uh, actually do and uh, have gotten in trouble as a result of it. Uh, we had this fellow who had published Science in the USSR uh, agreed to carry us there. He was head of the geology department at the University of Turkmenistan. Uh, I got the visa, wasn't cheap. <laughs> ready to go and uh, they fired him and he had to leave the country. Uh, when we applied for the permits, uh, they found out we were coming. They don't like that to be known. But in this journal, he says, if we speak about the human footprint, and notice that he's still just a little bit equivocating here, it was made by a human-like animal. He's not really sticking his neck out there, but <laughs> obviously so. Incredibly, the footprint is on the same plateau where there are dinosaur tracks. And he's led three expeditions there to investigate. He has offered to carry us sneaking across the border from Kazakhstan, where he is now. It's about six miles from Afghanistan. And we decided that we're going to wait a little while. This amazing fossil is from the Glen Rose area. This is my daughter's finger underneath. Uh, we recognize what that looks like, uh, but there are lots of rocks that just happen to look like things uh, accidentally, and so we wanted to see if there's any interior structure. Sometimes you find that in fossils, sometimes you don't, and so we sectioned here at a severe angle to get more information to see if there's any interior structure there, and sure enough, right? at the intersection, right where it's supposed to be, we see the bone material in the center of this fossil finger. Uh, this is Dr. Dale Peterson of uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, the last time I heard him lecture on this, it was an hour and a half lecture, and you don't want to know all about that, but he did the CAT scans and traced ligaments from one end to the other, and he has absolutely no doubt as uh, a professional anatomist that this is a human finger. A little further south, uh, 100 miles south of Glen Rose, we go near London, Texas, down toward Junction, uh, Fredericksburg in that vicinity. And in this uh, picturesque spot, uh, a number of years ago, a gentleman was fishing and looked at a rock and saw something sticking out of it and picked it up and hit it, and lo and behold, it's got a hammer in it. And the rock from this area, you look on all the geologic maps, this is lower Cretaceous, the same formation at Glen Rose, but lower down in the formation, supposed to be 140 million. 
But this is steel with an iron hammer. It's not hammer steel, it's a different type. No hammer is sold today made of this. The wooden handle is partially colified with quartz and calcite crystals in it, encased in the Cretaceous sandstone. Uh, I don't think the dinosaurs made that, but it's found in the rocks with the dinosaurs. Up in Oklahoma, we found this iron pot, which was in the coal that's supposedly 300 million years old. Man, according to the evolutionists, it's been around maybe a million, two million, depending on how you define him. But 295 million, you've got an iron pot. And this is the affidavit of the fellow who was working in the utility department there, uh, stoking the big furnace, and uh, he took a sledgehammer and broke the coal open and out popped fell the pot with the cast and the mold on either side. Uh, not supposed to be there. Similar situation here with this bell that was found in North Carolina uh, a number of years ago encased in coal again with the cast and the mold on either side. Uh, a close-up shows that this is not like things that we know about today but it's uh, it was encased in the coal. We have not only an affidavit from him, but he passed a lie detector test with flying colors that his story was true. And so the, the evidence just accumulates. Uh, travel with me to Utah. This is near the Four Corners area, near Blanding, Utah, under the arches at uh, Natural Bridges National Monument. And here, uh, Dr. Swift down there, who was working with me, is pointing up where the era is to uh, a protected area where the Anasazi Indians uh, did their petroglyphs about a thousand years ago, according to the park rangers. And you climb up there on that little ledge and look at that, and you see a number of the petroglyphs. It's covered with heavy desert varnish so that it's difficult to photograph. But uh, right over my head, you see the Anasazi warrior and then the snakes. But then right beside me, if we highlight the significant area, you can see the dinosaur, which even uh, the secular archaeologists have acknowledged sure looks like a dinosaur and covered with the varnish so that the antiquity is, is really not questioned. We go not too far from there, but over into Colorado, we see the three-horned dinosaur with the frill on its back. It looks more like a triceratops than the people. Uh, look like people. This is... Uh, done by the Fremont Indians who were contemporary with the Anasazi. And then we go to the Grand Canyon. We see what appears to be in the shape of uh, maybe an Allosaurus. Uh, someone shot him in the tail, which shows you what it looks like if you break through that heavy desert varnish, which indicates its antiquity. Uh, there was a, a write-up by a representative for the American Museum of Natural History in 1924 of this site describing Indians drawing dinosaurs, uh, though they wouldn't do that today. Uh, not because the evidence is not there, they just wouldn't do it. We travel down to Peru, and uh, this is Dr. Javier Cabrera, who was 20 years head of the Department of Medicine at the University of Lima, retired to be cultural anthropologist in Inca, ancestor of the Conquistadors, has a big 300-year-old castle there on the town square, and has a collection of Inca burial stones that uh, begun to be made by his father back in the 30s. He's continued that collection. These are stones that are buried with the, in the tombs with the, the Incas, and they have scenes carved over them, most of them. He has a collection now of over 11,000 of these burial stones. About a third of them are the most disgusting pornography you've ever seen but about a third of them have dinosaurs on them. Here is one in place in the tomb, but looking at a close-up of these stones, you can see the rather artistic rendition of the dinosaur. Interestingly, this one has the dermal frills on its back when Mr. Sinclair did his sign with the dinosaur. He didn't know that it had frills on its back, but they did it right. This was written up in Geology Magazine in 1992 for the first time, and we found them well preserved. But there are thousands of these stones. This is one of the larger ones. Again, rather artistically 
rendered. Looking at a close-up, you can see the dinosaur in the upper right-hand corner with the man foot in his mouth. All shapes and sizes and types of stones and uh, styles uh, of rendering, certainly not done by the same individual. Uh, some of them are almost oriental looking and some of them rather literal looking. Uh, here's one with a number of different species on it, but thousands of them. We have a number of others who have collected as well. We have a collection at the Aeronautical Museum in Lima. There were hundreds here. There are 40 that are left. They've been raided, uh, I think sold maybe <laughs> illegally. But you can still see the stones, some of the ones that are not as elaborate and beautiful as in the Cabrera collection, but obviously recognizable. Still in the National Aeronautical Museum, there's also a display in the Naval Museum and at least two other museums that I know of in, in Peru. Some of them uh, are still being excavated. This was one that was excavated in 2006 that is in the artifact room. It has two dinosaurs on it. Slightly different type stone from Cabrera's, raised instead of incised, but still the same general picture. Also in the tombs you find burial cloths with the same kind of motif there. Uh, obviously, uh, the big claws and the teeth representing dinosaurs. You see it on their pottery. That's relatively easy to date. These are dated at about 2,500 years ago. Uh, these are the Moshi pots and the style is well known and documented and they're represented in the National Museums. This one's in the National Museum in Lima. It says circa 2,500 years ago. Up in northern Peru, you have a good deal of gold in some of the, the ruins and tombs. This is a death mask, but look on either side of the face. <clears throat> Again, the dermal frills across the back, the tail curling up over and the huge teeth. These people were seeing dinosaurs. 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Now, we're told that we've known what dinosaurs look like for maybe, well, the first ones found in 1820, we didn't know what they looked like very well. The render, restorations were silly. Uh, after the turn of the century, early 1900s, we got a fair idea and really not an excellent idea. And, well, 1992, we learned the uh, Brontosaurus type had frills on its back. Uh, <clears throat> these people didn't show a gradation in learning. They got it right, right from the start. Likewise in Mexico, we've made a number of trips there in central highlands near Acambro in the city, uh, state of Guanajuato. Dr. Swift and I have been down there a number of times investigating. It took that many times to get through all the bureaucracy. When we got there, they were being hidden in the back of the police department. But it was a collection made by uh, Waldemar Yulsrud back in the early 1900s of some 30,000 ceramic figurines, about 10% of which are of dinosaurs, but a wide range of animals and creatures. Some of the brontosaurus type were standing up. We didn't know that until recently. Bacher's book, Dinosaur Heresies, published in 86, was really the first one who suggested that. And then, of course, Spielberg convinced us all they stood up. But this is exactly the way they're rendered by the artist, and these date to well before the time of Christ uh, from several sources. Uh, again, there are thousands of them, and the styles indicate far more than one artist. Uh, one of the professors from the University of Texas at Arlington, who is an art professor, said there were at least a hundred different artists represented in the collection, uh, would be his estimate. This is my wife's favorite. Uh, obviously, if you've got one that looks like a dinosaur, a man did it, but sewing them together <laughs> is interesting. Man and dinosaur obviously live together. The, you pick up any of the dinosaur books today, and it, how does it start out? Millions and millions of years ago. And then the second paragraph says, no man ever saw a dinosaur. And that's just like you can't write a dinosaur book unless you start that way. It ain't so. Year before last, we traveled to Cambodia following evidence that had been forwarded to us by one of the tour guides there who had seen our website. And we had done some research and confirmed a good bit of what he was telling us. In the upper part of Cambodia, we see the ancient Khmer Empire had built 
just spectacular temples, maybe the largest and most beautiful in the world. And one of the greatest monument builders was J. E. Vardaman VII. He's almost idolized. This is a picture that I took there in Phnom Penh uh, of the Buddha-like pose. He began to rule in 1181 and built to prom and uh, dedicated it in 1186. This was dedicated to his mother. It was a Buddhist monastery. And so we know who and when and all the specifics. Well, on the stone in this temple, a very beautiful, picturesque place, you see carvings, and they're stone carvings that cover just about every square inch of it. But just inside the front entrance in the corner here that the arrow points to, you can see a series of animals from the jungle and notice in the series there is a perfect stegosaurus in a temple from over 800 years ago and we're supposed to have known what dinosaurs looked like for about 150 and then they've been gone 65 million I believe there's something wrong with that story I don't want any comments about two fossils here or two dinosaurs <laughs> they're just one but it is more proof of the co-occurrence.